Um, as racism and injustice permeate all facets of life, this symposium is necessarily interdisciplinary. It's been developed in collaboration between not just the School of Public Health, but also the Department of Philosophy and the Think Group across campus, and brings together a truly interdisciplinary group of scholars. It's my pleasure to introduce the first of these speakers, Chandra Ford. Dr. Ford is an associate professor in community health sciences and the founding director of the Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice, and Health at the Fielding School of Public Health at the University of California at Los Angeles. I had the pleasure of working with Chandra when I was at UCLA and greatly appreciated her wise counsel, her creativity, and her methodological rigor. Chandra, I'm excited to hear about the great work you've been doing in your new center and to welcome you to the University of Washington. Oh, my oh, my <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's quite a privilege to be here. I've been looking forward to this day for quite some time. Um, to be at this, the second Race, Health and Justice, Benjamin Rabinowitz Symposium in Medical Ethics. I want to thank the organizers and I want to um, thank Anjum Kaja in particular for the opportunity to participate um, and also for inviting me to, to share some of my work with you all. The work of doing intellectual work is work and even coming up with the idea is a lot of work and I just want to make that point explicit here and again thank the organizers. I thank um, Dr. Haja, Furry, Hedy Lee, and the Ornelas for the um, vision and also for the organizers more broadly for helping to manifest it. <coughs> I come to you this morning uh, as one who is eager to get to the work of fighting racism. I come to you <coughs> feeling angry and hopeful, exhausted and scarred yet unwilling to retreat, frustrated by the lack of movement on some fronts, and intrigued by the progress on other fronts. I feel particularly protective of some communities, transgender women of color, American Indian women, black, brown, and indigenous men and boys, our youth, our elders, others. Yes. We are in a moment now when anyone who wishes can plainly see for themselves that racism exists in our society. But before we pat ourselves on the back, as a public health person, and that's how I come to you, we are supposed to be about preventing the possibility of such a moment. Black, indigenous, and people of color, or BIPOC, have been documenting the growth of racism for years prior to this moment. So its predictable ugliness may tempt some of us to utter, we told you so. We warned you. We advised that black people were being shot in the streets by police, unfairly, perhaps even wantonly. That despite access to marriage, shared health insurance plans, and beautiful homes in gentrified neighborhoods for some LGBT people. BIPOC transgender women face brutal violence daily in these United States of America. We told you that immigration is racialized and that there is an underbelly that supports this American way of life. That underbelly survives in part by terrorizing migrants and their communities, exploiting their labor and threatening their humanity. So what do we do now? So this is a heck of a way to start, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, what society does may depend in part on what some of us in here do today. Um, I believe we here must begin exactly as we are doing today, and that is by opening our eyes, um, acknowledging um, the problems that we must confront, coming together from our diverse disciplinary and demographic backgrounds to illuminate and understand the challenges we face, connecting across difference and hopefully beginning 
for continuing to develop strategies to help advance health equity. <clears throat> Monday, October 14th, the second Monday in October, marks Indigenous Peoples Day uh, in Los Angeles. October 9th, 2017, two years ago, was the day that LA initiated this process of renaming Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. And it's also the day that I launched the Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice, and Health at UCLA. That was not a coincidence, it was intentional. So I acknowledge that I do my work in Southern California at UCLA on lands originally inhabited by and cared for by the Gabriel, excuse me, Gabrielino Tonga peoples. And no doubt the displacement of these nations, um, which still exist today, enabled the establishment of my land grant institution, which is now considered by some among you know, the best and number one public uh, university in the country. And this is a reminder that even those of us who have legitimate claims about US racism are complicit with and benefit from injustices visited upon the indigenous peoples of the, of the Americas. So in titling this talk, Racism is a Public Health Issue, I wanted to focus on the salience of racism for the field of public health. And I, I would broaden it a little bit beyond that to say the health sciences and those of us who are interested in the health of populations. Um, and to think about this in terms of the goals, culture, mission, methods, workforce. Um, how does racism affect the field itself and the ways the field contributes to society? In the time allotted me today, I want to accomplish three things. First, how we define a problem shapes how we approach it. So I want to offer several different definitions of racism to guide us in thinking about it. Um, next, I want to explain some of the reasons why I assert that racism is a public health issue. And finally, I firmly believe there are actions that we can take to fight it. And so I share how I draw on <coughs> critical race theory to conduct my work race consciously, and I conclude by raising several questions or challenges that I hope are actually difficult um, for you all. I do find them difficult. But I believe that we in this room can explore them together throughout the day um, in order to try to come up with some strategies to address them. Now, um, we are sitting on the West Coast, which um, many refer to as the Left Coast. And um, I would like for us to remain rooted in thinking about the ways in which racism operates today and here in our environs, because it's very easy to point to the South or to point to people who do not share our political views as a way of highlighting the problems of racism. And that's fine, but the question is what are we going to do uh, in our own home? And so in my own home, Los Angeles, um, Throughout the period that, uh, that we have thought of as post-racial, actually, that has been called post-racial, um, and I have more recent data that go beyond 2015, even in Los Angeles, rates of uh, hate crimes, as tracked by the FBI and the Southern Poverty Law Center, have existed, and actually they've been increasing um, in communities of color. So let's start by defining racism. Um, there are a number of different ways to define it. Many of us in the room have actually published definitions of it, but I'd like to offer five different definitions, and I'll ask you just to reflect upon them. There might be different dimensions of them that stand out for you, um, either in positive or negative ways, or just uh, informative in terms of thinking about what are the implications for the work that I want to do. So the first was uh, published in 1967 by Pierre Vandenberg, um, an anthropologist and sociologist, defining racism as any set of beliefs that are organic, genetically transmitted differences, whether those are real or imagined, between human groups are intrinsically associated with the presence or the absence of certain socially relevant abilities, 
or characteristics. Hence, hence that such differences are a legitimate basis of invidious distinctions between groups socially defined as <coughs> races. And a couple of things that I'll just highlight about this definition. Um, one is it's anchored to the understanding of racism as tied to beliefs. Um, it is interesting to think about the, the thinking in terms of genetics here, because this was 1967. How might the technologies of today, um, we could ask actually, how are the technologies of today helping to re, uh, reinforce a sort of racial essentialism um, based on a definition like this one. Um, and we can certainly see that the racial groups that are uh, referenced here are not simply differences, but that there is an inherent value, uh, valuation, differential value, valuation of the groups. The social epidemiologist Nancy Krieger has defined it as an, an oppressive system of racial relations justified by ideology in which one racial group benefits from dominating another and defines itself and others through this domination. Now certainly here one thing we can see immediately is the emphasis on the system rather than on beliefs. Beliefs might be a part of the system or an outgrowth of it. That system is oppressive. It's interesting here that while a lot of public health and other work focuses on differences tied to socioeconomic factors, uh, Krieger here is emphasizing that ideological criteria or ideological, excuse me, an oppressive system of racial relations justified by ideology in which one racial group benefits from dominating another and defines itself and others through that domination. So in contrast to understandings of racism that are anchored to simply a very sort of simplistic understanding of uh, socioeconomic competition, Krieger's definition uh, makes clear that there is more at stake than simply economic gains in, under, in the racial relations. In a seminal paper published in 1996, the black South African researcher Alan Herman defined racisms as conditions based on the fabrication of race. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> conditions based on the fabrication of race uh, that uh, lead to exclusions from goods and services, opportunities and privileges, rights and powers, and even social responsibilities and burdens of those defined as racially other. And this definition foregrounds the problematic construct of race and captures ways that racism limits access to privilege and inclusion and also implies that racialized others can only have at max partial uh, citizenship. The former president of the American Public Health Association, Kamara Phyllis Jones, who led the field in advancing an anti-racism collaborative, defined racism as, quote, a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, uh, which is what people call race, that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and also saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And then finally, the geographer and former president of the American Studies Association, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, has defined racism as the state sanction and or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Now that definition is quite cumbersome relative to what we in public health typically use. However, I find this definition to be quite meaningful in terms of 
linking racism inherently to what it does to the body. And so there is no way to think about what racism is doing without thinking about the implications for well-being. Also, this definition is helpful in helping to convey that racism is not something proximal necessarily, but that it is systems of broader racialization, one might say. In fact, I actually often use the term racialization rather than racism in order to draw more attention to just that very point. That is, that we can think of racism or racialization as processes by which social mechanisms generate um, the inequalities that we're looking at. Um, so they generate and sustain both the groups, right, the processes of racializing people from being people to being clustered into groups that are racialized, um, and to racializing the patterns um, and outcomes that we see. That racialization is not something that's separate from our daily lives and the existence that we live. It is a normative part of society. And it, it permeates every facet of our life. And as Dr. Kamara Jones's definition um, made clear, that the benefits, there are both benefits and uh, adverse consequences of racism. And one easy way to think of that for me is to think about environmental hazards. And we know that environmental hazards are disproportionately located in poor racial and ethnic minority communities. And if we think about two communities and one environmental hazard, and it has to be located either in a poor community of color or in a white community, um, we know that if the hazard is located in the community of color, it is by definition not in the white community. So the health hazards that the children growing up in the community of color experience are directly tied to the health advantages that the kids growing up in the white community experience. If we, for, for example, just uh, are trying to understand why the poor children, the children of color are doing poorly, and focus on trying to understand their cultural factors, their behaviors, we'll miss it entirely. We'll need to step back and look at the dynamics that might lead to um, the predictable placement of the hazard in this particular kind of community. So racialization operates through a variety of mechanisms. I've just listed a few here. Kamara Jones has been uh, probably more influential than anyone else in terms of trying to convey through story and narrative different ways that racism operates. And she talks about three different socioecologic levels. But whatever socioecologic model we rely upon, racism is operating across every level. And it's operating um, across every level simultaneously. So we've defined, offered some definitions of racism. Um, the question here is racism a public health issue is not one that's in my title. I considered sharing a title that was, is racism a public health issue? I decided to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> it is a public health issue. Um, let's talk a little bit about why. And my points here are not exhaustive, but they're just um, offered as a way to think about how does one respond to concerns or questions about racism in public health. And one way to think about it is to think about, excuse me, if someone could please let me know if I'm not advancing this slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, one way to think about it is to think about our field and the ways in which racism has shaped our field. Um, historically, Racism has been foundational to establishing the biomedical sciences, right? Um, also, racism played a historical role and also persistent role through discrimination. So we can think about historically in terms of Jim Crow affecting who could get into which schools, 
um, where uh, clinicians could practice, which kinds of hospitals and those things. Um, in a book that we just published called Racism, Science and Tools for the Public Health Professional, Collins Ari and Bua and Juliet Duell and Moore talk about the ways in which racism also operates within our institutions contemporarily. And so how can we think about the different streams through which we send our students, depending in part on their socioeconomic background and their racial ethnic minority status. Racism also um, operates to the extent that an embrace of the sense of science is objective and therefore it's not possibly racist influences the work that we do and the ways that we go about our work. Not only because it shapes what it is that we do, right? So it makes it impossible almost for us to recognize the biases that we bring to our work, but also because in so doing it silences the voices that are, that are saying, if there's a problem here, why not consider this? Why not consider that? It's also important to point out that public health also has a history of advocacy and fighting um, against racism. We could also think about the ways that racism uh, affects communities of color. And the number of studies published in this area over the last uh, 20 years has just grown literally exponentially. Um, and it shows that out there in communities that we can see how various forms of racism, especially interpersonal forms of racism, for instance, not getting the same kind of treatment from providers, has real and material consequences for um, people of color. Um, another consideration if we think about the communities with whom we work is that if the majority of communities um, that we're dealing with for public health are communities um, made up of black, indigenous, and other people of color communities in the United States, and some might argue globally. Um, since these communities are susceptible to the adverse effects of racism, to understand and address entirely the issues that confront their lives, we must also understand racism. We can't, that's not an element that we can just decide to ignore or overlook. So for me, one way to uh, try to address this is to draw on critical race theory. And my interest in critical race theory is in, in, there are a couple of elements to it. First is how can we marry the sort of strong methodological rigor that we like to assert within public health with an equally strong level of rigor when thinking about racialized constructs, populations, communities, etc. Another is how can we begin to account for the ways in which racialization is affecting us, our work, me, myself, our field, at the same time that I'm conducting empirical work. So, um, for critical race theory, the central questions are focused around the primacy of racism. That is, how do we center the concerns about racialization? Um, and, and in a way that acknowledges how embedded it is, not only in society, but also within our field. Um, the temporal considerations. So much of what we do when we think about measuring racism in the research that tries to capture racism still enumerates racial exposures that are, I would say, a little bit dated, right? Um, in the sense that they capture uh, ways that people are treated in more explicit uh, forms of racism. The ways that racism operates today are not yet fully captured in many instruments. It's much more subtle, and yes, I say that despite the um, growth of uh, you know, white supremacist groups and those other forms of egregious, more overt forms, forms of racism. So how can we develop measures and approaches that reflect the ways in which racism operates in a contemporary moment? <laughs> and then how can we research within a field that's dedicated to uh, the belief in the objectivity of science um, in ways that are racially conscious. 
Those are some central concerns. So uh, in public health, there are essentially three main ways that critical race theory is making inroads. The first is that critical race theorists from law are publishing in the biomedical and public health literature, and you'll hear from <coughs> Professor Dorothy Roberts later today. Um, health equity researchers might draw on one or more critical race theory constructs, especially to do conceptual work or to uh, do commentaries and those kinds of things, or to talk about the implications of empirical research. And then finally, um, health equity researchers might try to use an entire empirical process. And there have been a few that have been uh, advanced. Lewis Graham has, um, is one that has put out one, and it's primarily focused on qualitative work. And Collins, Ari, and Bula and I put out one in 2010 called the Public Health Critical Race Praxis, which is um, what I'll walk through here very briefly. So the entire purpose of Public Health Critical Race Praxis and Kimmy Doe here has actually published some work based on it, um, is to try to apply elements of critical race theory that are really salient for public health to apply it critically. Now, actually, to be honest with you, some critical race theorists would cringe at hearing two words of what I just said, both apply and empirically. Um, and so sometimes I do find my own self cringing when I, when I say it, but I think it's the most uh, honest description of what we're doing. And by that, what I mean is um, we want to ask two questions and incorporate a concern with these questions into the empirical work that we do. The first is, how is racialization relevant to the problem that we're studying? And with that, for instance, we might think about, uh, so for instance, in my work around HIV, you know, how does historical stereotyping of blacks as hypersexual, um, prone to crime and illegal behavior, et cetera, et cetera, influence not only African Americans' attitudes towards prevention messages, but the kinds of treatment that African Americans receive when they present for care. Um, and then secondly, how is racialization relevant to the production of knowledge about the problem? And so here we're thinking about um, how for the sciences where the work is inherently incremental, right? So I don't just go out and come up with a study idea of a clear blue sky. I build on the body of evidence that exists. However, I recognize that body of evidence contains within it biases with which I might you know, directly um, take issue. And so how do we sort of think about those things um, while we're carrying out the work? The goal, of course, is moving towards racial equity. For us, there are some critical elements of it. How can we keep our own selves in check in the process, recognizing that we carry some element of privilege? Even those of us who are coming from marginalized communities carry some element of privilege if we're carrying out this work. Um, our, another goal is to identify and illuminate the ways in which racialization is operating here, to document problems that may not otherwise get documented, at least as such, to challenge normative paradigms, and to provide alternative uh, messages and frames. And so for us, with the growing body of work on racism's relationship to various specific health outcomes, health disparities, health care outcomes, we want to push ourselves beyond merely documenting those empirical relationships to doing anti-racism research. Um, thinking about what does it mean to undermine an existing racialized power structure while carrying out empirical research. So I'll just talk very briefly about the public health critical race praxis. It is essentially an empirical approach that has three elements. 
The first is a race conscious orientation, um, which you can see here as the sort of outer circle. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. A four stage process for carrying out the work that's shown here. And then a set of uh, terms or principles drawn directly from critical race theory that my uh, collaborator Collins Irene Boo and I believe are really particularly important for thinking about health equity in the context of public health, um, public health work. So drawing on those principles, one starts by first enumerating, you know, developing some sense of racial consciousness about the work that's going to happen. And that's not just like, you know, sitting out on the beach and, you know, feeling it, you know. <laughs> but it involves studying and, and accessing the literature and the work. There is an enormous and robust literature that is already exploring these questions, and we do need to start by tapping into it. There is, I will admit, a tremendous amount of humility involved in this process, okay? Um, and then, so that's the first step. The, a, a, a establishing a sense of racial consciousness and articulating it. Um, the next is to assess the current dynamics of racial uh, racialization. So here is where we really want to anchor the study in an understanding of racial dynamics uh, in terms of the ways that racial, racism is operating for the period of interest of the study. The second is to clarify biases in the field and this is actually where Kemi's work has been really influential and really important. Um, next, in terms of empirical work, is developing good measures, concepts and measures that, are, that reflect the previous stages and this racialization, this awareness of the biases in the field, a sense of what contemporary racial dynamics are like relative to the problem, and finally to take action. And to take action can mean a lot of different things. For some of us, that taking action will be a modest step of you know, taking the next study to the next level. But take action could be something that's more aggressive or more assertive, working with community members. Um, the primary thing to keep in mind in terms of taking action is that it should be rooted in the margins, not simply in replicating and the existing um, power dynamics. Again, for um, a field that's based on incremental progress, taking action could mean taking action based on the findings, but it could also mean taking action, taking action based on the process, right? So if part of what we're saying is the process of carrying out work should also reflect, we should model equity in doing the research. And thus there is something to be learned and gained and shared through that process as well. There are now a lot of different approaches, and these are just several of them, for doing racism work in public health. Um, and many of them share characteristics with public health critical race practices. I've circled health disparities work because that's a broad category that people often use. You can see that it share some sort of quote-unquote requirements with public health critical race practices, though not all of them. So I've talked about some of the problems, um, and I've illustrated one way that, um, that I'm trying to think about how to do something about it. So many people are overwhelmed to the point of um, being, you know, totally paralyzed when it comes to doing something about racism in public health, but there are some things that I think are worth, worth doing now. And the first, however funny or small it might seem, is actually to name it. To name it. Um, yeah, we could talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second is to study it. Um, and by that I mean that as individuals, regardless of the area of expertise that we hold, that we too can study racism. This is not something that's only in the purview of community health scientists or health educators or sociologists, that all of us can benefit 
um, and our work can be better by having a richer understanding of the ways in which power dynamics underlying racialization influence the well-being of communities, all communities, in our society. Um, and I think the other thing that we can do is start with ourselves. And with ourselves here, I mean in our own individual persons, as well as in the networks that we operate, and within our fields. And actually, I'd say that that is another strength of critical race theory, that while some critique critical race theory, I would say falsely, as disconnected from its disciplines, that it's a form of commitment to the disciplines, that it shows that this holds up a mirror to the disciplines and asks the disciplines to live up to what it is they claim to be achieving. And in public health, that would be a, a, con a commitment to health for all, a commitment to equity. So starting at home for us in this room would mean to think about liberal forms of racism. We are not going to see the same kinds of ways that racism operates um, with liberal racism as it does with the kinds of racism we see on, on the news. Um, here we need to address power imbalances both within the field and um, between the field and marginalized communities. And I would say not only in the United States, but globally, keeping in mind that that global consideration includes the sovereign nations within the Americas. Um, it would involve acknowledging and relinquishing consolidated privilege. So what are the ways in which, for instance, and actually, um, uh, Arya Buett and Ewell Moore talk about this in academic settings, what are the ways in which privilege is consolidated in ways that render marginalized academics, researchers, practitioners trying to do the work around equity? Uh, address a diversity racket. Um, we need to first understand what is Diversity. What is the concern with diversity? How is that different from concerns with disparities, right? Because often the two are conflated or combined in ways that are not distinct from one another. Um, concerns with addressing and improving diversity are important. The diversity racket is when those meaningful and substantive efforts are reduced to tokenism or to strategies that do not work against the consolidation of white privilege or uh, dynamics of power that sustain it. And then um, for those of us who come from marginalized communities, how do we operate in settings where on the one hand we are privileged and on the other hand we also are marginalized and disadvantaged? And I recommend something I call dynamic decentering. That's this way of constantly being in this mode of evaluating to what extent am I carrying privilege and how can I draw on it to, um, to how can I leverage it for good in this moment? And in what ways am I marginalized and do I need to recognize that and protect myself perhaps? Um, and that's important because sometimes it's possible that those of us who are coming from the margins might not recall that there are people from even deeper margins, um, and we may not fully represent them. And so how can we continue to be connected uh, to that, connected and committed to them? I've talked a lot about researcher, excuse me, research. <clears throat> because that's my own background and that's what I can share from. But the Penn 3 model is a cultural model for health education and community outreach is an excellent example of how to apply what we're talking about in doing a community outreach and work. And I just want to draw your attention to the, to the cultural empowerment circle at the bottom and what uh, Collins Arimbula, who developed this model, actually, she was like more than two decades ago, 
um, is asking us to do is to recognize that when we enter a community with a plan to help or with a, with a goal to help address some problem, with a plan to come up with some intervention, we may not have a plan, but with intent to come up with an intervention, that every community, regardless of how ever bad the situation might seem, has strengths, they have something positive, elements that are positive, there might also be elements that are negative, that are indeed negative, and that we do need to address. But there are also these existential elements, as he calls them, which are things that we might get distracted about, focused on, and we might even try to change them. But in fact, they are not germane to the work we're doing. And our goal is not to go in and change cultures. Our goal is to go in and address barriers to optimal health. So how can we go in and recognize things that promote optimal health, things that impede optimal health, and things that, and here's where we recognize our own biases, we're distracted by, but they're not actually part of the problem. Um, and so I really love that about this particular model. <clears throat> Explicating our biases is really important. Uh, one of my earliest mentors, the environmental, epi environmental justice epidemiologist Steve Wing, um, used to talk about this a lot. And one of his seminal papers to me is, is still one of my absolute favorite papers. It's called Who's Epidemiology? Who's Health? Um, what it reminds us is that the systematic processes of, uh, quote unquote, um, uh, the systematic processes of science do not make it bias free, right? So to say that science is objective as a way of dismissing the possibility of it having biases or racial influences, um, I would say is false. What I would say is that it enhances the reliability, the reproducibility of findings. But that does not necessarily mean that it's bias-free in any way. Um, so public health critical race practices challenges this presumed objectivity. And the perpetual question is, how do we do our work challenging objectivity, um, challenging the presumption of objectivity um, in a field where that's considered the norm? Like, how do we protect junior faculty, for instance? who are trying to go up against the grain. Or if faculty of color are the ones um, laying out their biases and no one else's, how does that further um, you know, impact them? Because then there's a possibility that it will be seen as, unfortunately, these people are biased and the rest of us are not. <laughs> In my own research, um, one thing that we did in a big, sort of big data project um, funded by the NIH, you, it relies on the health records, the electronic health records of HIV patients and patients in primary care in this prospective study, um, was to literally survey ourselves, the researchers, as we conducted the work the NIH was paying us to do. And so prior to beginning each, the analyses for each set of aims, um, everyone on the research team had to complete a brief questionnaire that was confidential um, online that indicated, you know, what do you expect to find? What's the basis for this, you know, for your expectation? Um, is it, you know, your prior expertise? Is it what we've learned thus far? Is it just a hunch? And you know, people actually did say yes, it's just a hunch. Um, so. <laughs> um, and so at this stage, we're only using this information qualitatively so that as we look at our results, we can kind of see, well, let's be very cautious here in deciding that what counts as an outlier is this, given that we went into the study expecting to see that. Um, but in our next steps, we're hoping to look at this using more, st more sophisticated statistical techniques. And also, not just to look so proximally like 
um, what do I expect to find on this set of analyses, but to think about involving um, ethicists from outside of our study team who could help us to understand what kinds of biases shaped even the initial proposal. Um, I do want to just mention this book because I almost want to say now you see it, now you don't, because technically it's published, but um, I've seen on Twitter that it's very hard to get a copy of it. Um, <laughs> but um, I was fortunate to publish this book commissioned by the American Public Health Association. It just came out in August. But how do we move these concerns with things like critical race theory, which might feel very academic to a health educator or an environmental scientist or a biostatistician, into the hands of practitioners, right? And so um, I think it's critical that frontline public health professionals be involved in evaluating these concerns about racialization more seriously. Um, I say that in part acknowledging that I believe they can. I believe we can learn from folks on the front line, and I believe folks on the front line can and do want to advance, um, you know, involve more serious consideration of race, race, racialization, race, ethnicity, and related concepts. In one chapter in this book, um, my colleague Kia Screen Jeffers and I try to outline some ways that critical race theory in particular could be used on the front lines of public health. So it could be used by those working in institutional settings to help them enumerate the different ways that racism is operating in those, in those settings. Imagine how helpful that would be for researchers who are looking to try to find ways to, um, to, to, to try to find more appropriate contemporary measures of the ways that racism, racism is operating within public health. Um, they can help to document racism exposures in communities. How? Public health professionals working on the front lines see many of the things that we're talking about. Um, but on their intake forms, it doesn't necessarily say document you know, the treatment people are receiving from their landlords or the very, you know, those kinds of things. And so the question is, can we um, empower frontline public health professionals to record things that go undocumented in their interactions in communities? Um, public health professionals could use critical race theory in applied research, like conducting program evaluation. Right, so right now a lot of the work is uh, what we would call colorblind. It doesn't necessarily acknowledge racism-related factors that are influencing the success or failure of the development, implementation, and success of programs. So how might um, public health professionals working in the front, on the front lines be able to, um, to, to study those things, to understand them, and to address them? Um, and then finally, they could help to shift toward capturing the social constructedness of health inequities. And what do I mean by that? So much of the information that we use in our research, and I actually would say this is going to become <coughs> even more important as we rely more and more on quote-unquote fake data, is we rely on intake forms, on medical records, and so forth, that these frontline public health professionals are capturing, right? They're the ones who administer the forms. How can we ensure that the information on those forms, or how can we help the information on those forms capture dimensions of social inequality that are not currently captured? So now those forms capture things like, what's your race and ethnicity? Um, what if they captured more of how do people treat you? What do people assume your race and ethnicity is? those kinds of things. Um, that would be a different set of questions. And speaking of questions, I've covered a lot, um, but as a good professor, I'm going to end with questions. <laughs> um, and the questions I would ask us to continue to engage throughout the symposium include how do liberal forms of racism help maintain the status quo 
how do we reconcile the academic culture of creating stars, which in my opinion <coughs> works directly against what we need, which is to create collectivities? What is the role of the investigator, of the researcher, in confronting institutionalized racism? And that's important because some of us have been trained that to be a good researcher, again, touching on this objectivity element, is to do my work and to publish it in the scientific literature, period. Um, what does it mean to be even thinking about how I might change institutions, communities, connect to social groups, et cetera, especially as a researcher, as someone who's bringing my expertise to those, work, uh, to those efforts. If we think about our institutions as the master's house, Audre Lorde asked us to think about, well, actually, she didn't ask us. She said the master's <laughs> tools cannot dismantle the master's house, but I would ask us to think about are there tools that can be used to dismantle, at least in part, the, man the master's house. Um, and then finally, <coughs> for researchers, we are trained to document problems by, by producing evidence. Um, and I will not show it here. But this question for me arises out of the many black lives um, that have been lost at the hands um, that have triggered, pulled the trigger on guns, um, the loss of black lives to police violence in particular. For years and decades, black people have been complaining about this. In fact, if you look historically in the United States, almost every major um, it's hard to think of any single major uprising in the United States that was not catalyzed by police violence in the black community. Um, so we now have evidence. We have lots of evidence. What do we do if the evidence is not enough to move the needle? So let me conclude by saying um, that racism affects the health of populations. It informs our fields in a variety of ways. There are a number of tools that we can draw on to try to fight back or eat, at, eat in at racism and its effects on communities and the field. Um, but there are still some absolutely urgent questions that we have to be willing to tackle. And so I would say onward, yes, there is a war raging, um, but your leadership, trained, courageous, bold, equipped, and I would add creative, <coughs> is needed. So let us prepare and charge forward together. Um, I'm happy to uh, take questions.
The first part is Address, but I'm, I'm feeling like there's another aspect of this, which is, you know, I, and I think you address this really well, is I have inherent biases as far as what kind of work I think is important or what kind of research I think is important, you know. Um, and there's, you know, with a couple of faculty members, I've had some um, conversations recently about kind of balancing sort of adding to the kind of general knowledge that's, you know, very kind of nebulous, but um, is is not as actionable and like what can we actually work on it so I guess that's part of my um, question is like how can um, maybe what is that process of acknowledging our privilege and how that affects how we you know create our research questions um, um, what might that look in, look like in practice that is such an important question and I that, that's such an important question. Um, and it's a question that to answer 
really to ask and to answer requires um, a fair amount of humility. Um, there are people who have been working on what does it mean to leverage white privilege um, in order to advance racial health equity. And one person who comes to mind for me is um, Vic Schombach at the University of North Carolina, S-C-H-O-E-N-B-A-C-H. He has created this enormous wealth, actually enormous wealth of video and other resources documenting you know, the work that people have been doing um, to try to do this kind of thing. And even in his own career, um, he recently retired um, as an associate professor because he decided that he could not simply forsake the communities he had been working with and be another one of those white guys who made his career. Um, off of basically exploiting the black friends and communities that he had. So I'm not saying that you need to give up your career, but there might be opportunities to partner um, with collaborators who are coming from very different places and to think about, you know, maybe you do take one of those sort of abstract ideas that just get you in the middle of the library um, for some work, but also work with someone else on something and allow their vision to drive it. Um, I think partnering is a really big part of it. And also, at the same time, recognizing that just seeing someone who, um, who might seem different to you doesn't mean that they are bringing a radical, margin-centered vision to the work. And so developing your own sense critical consciousness is going to be essential in order to be able to perceive that. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Ford is amazing as usual. Um, when you brought up the slide of the diversity racket, hit home briefly. And I also, um, it made me reflect on what I also feel like is the disparities racket. Um, which is that we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on disparities. We do have centers, we have researchers, well-funded, we have structures in place that benefit from the perpetuation of disparities and benefit from a very limited efficacy of the interventions that are rolled out and the way the science is conducted. And so I'm curious thinking about an institution like the NIH and those of us who are working in this critical race space, trying to make the kind of incremental change that's meaningful, do you have reflections on the role of alternative funding sources and alternative strategies? Um, given the, the, the kind of large challenge it is to, sometimes, to adapt this kind of work to um, fit what has been the disparities racket for so long? That's such a fundamental question. Um, the short answer is I don't have a good answer for you. And I believe part of the reason why I don't have a good answer for you is because I'm caught up in the diversity racket carrying a bunch of you know diversity things. So I, I can't actually get to the um, you know, the disparities work or the, 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 the work that pushes the envelope that I'd like to do, right? So I think the two are tied. Um, and I haven't had an opportunity to read it yet, though I did see the headlines everywhere about... And the only thing I could think in response to the headline itself, which was that um, basically something like part of the disparity in funding, NIH funding for racial and ethnic minorities is due to their choice of topic. And the first thing that wrote, that occurred to me is, okay, I have to write in response to that title. <laughs> because certainly it is not the individual that's driving the NIH agenda. It's the NIH agenda 
Um, and so, um, other sources of funding outside of NIH, for me this is a tension. On the one hand, there are other sources of funding outside of the NIH, but within our field, those sources of funding are already quote unquote colored as not as influential or reputable as NIH funding. They don't carry the same sort of weight. Um, in my work, in my career, and I, I'm tenured now, and so I have a different sort of perspective. Well, actually, I don't really, but I, I think that, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that it's different, um, the, the risks are different. And that is that what I struggled with, and what I hear you struggling with, is how much of my commitment should be to the work regardless, period, mm -hmm. versus to, do, to get what I deserve as a scholar, as a researcher, as a scientist. And I'm reluctant to answer that question in part because I feel it is my responsibility to encourage you to do the very best work you can do regardless of whatever constraints there might be out there. Um, Derek Bell, the father of critical race theory, um, talked about advancing things that were utterly impossible, not because they were possible and pragmatic and, and those things, but because the process itself was liberating. And so there is something to that. But what it is, I cannot offer you yet in terms of NIH support or I would say what I would offer, and others might have some other kind of interest to give on this, but what I can offer is that where you are coming from is so powerful and beautiful and essential and needed that we cannot put all of that in the hands of the NIH. Um, so treasure it and, and continue to try to advance it as you can, even though there's, there's no easy way to <laughs> uh, thank you. I uh, enjoyed your presentation. I have another comment over the last questions. I've been in five, six universities for about four or five years, and I've served in the NIH, you know, uh, as yeah. the study committee and so on. Uh, we often feel that NIH and Congress is so big that the individual we cannot really influence. Uh -huh. But I know several cases, if it's from a small group, whether it's a racism or public health, if you write to your congressman and senator, they do pay attention. And the small group, if you testify in Congress once, and line item budget comes in, or the budget goes up in that fee. Uh, so it is not as big and impervious. A small group really can create an impact. And, and every people, with every, you know, every scientist studying, they think that there is not enough funding in there. Whether it's a cancer, heart disease, and in general, I think NIH is funding is over 1 in 10. For every 10 application, one gets funded. If you want to increase the overall part of money, and it's an important topic, it is possible to influence that just by a small group of people. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really love that you put the picture of Steve Wing up who is also a mentor of mine, and um, finished his career as an associate professor for the same reasons as, as Vic, because he didn't want to jeopardize his relationship um, in, for advancement of his um, um, career. Um, so we talked about, you talked about um, public health critical race practice in terms of studying it and research and application for a public health professional. Um, I'm, one, I'm curious about how best to integrate it into a classroom and into a syllabus in a way that's not only studied and kind of passively read about or discussed, but is really truly felt um, as deeply as possible in a classroom setting. In my class on um, critical race theory and public health, the way that I do it is not structured simply around the, the sort of empirical model, 
I think they have one session where they think about the empirical model and it's later in the course, uh, in the course of, of the term. Um, my emphasis is on the need for us to get outside of the linear thinking that we have become trapped within, within academia. And so, for instance, um, <coughs> with their major product that they have to produce by the end of the project that they have to produce at the end of the term, they work in groups to create some creative expression. And <laughs> the only rule they really have is it cannot be a linear paper. Um, and last year, they um, made, some students made a film, others did a play, um, and they drew on critical race theory in ways that had to do with public health. For me, the most important thing was creating a space, a sort of buffer zone, where they could do that. I felt like to articulate you know, very clear sort of limits on what they could do was problematic because I feel my own self to be very constrained and, and very committed to the very things I critique. Um, so all I really want to do is create a space where they could be challenged, you know, and actually it took a lot to challenge them in terms of even thinking against um, the essentialism, you know, racial essentialism that, that they even still carry and so forth. But by the end of the quarter, they're really there and they're ready to go. I think that's so critical because I, I don't know how much we are going to radically change things, those of us who are already employing the new systems. But we can play a critical role in have, helping the next generations take things beyond what we can visualize. Because if we can visualize it, it's really not all that radical. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. More questions? I thought it was so interesting um, trying to move away from stars and academia to collectivities. And I think this is what you guys are trying to do with the Think Network. Um, I guess I'm just curious, can you, like, what can you get us to visualizing that, even though it might not be the thing we can't visualize yet? How do, like, how do we start restructuring so that that's possible within a, an institution? I think it's very possible to do that because it starts with our own persons, with our own individual selves. For instance, just working with my doctoral students. Um, I don't know, many of you may have been in environments where students really feel like they're competing against one another. I'm not happening, right? They need to realize that this person is the person 10 years from now, you're going to be looking around. That will be your colleague. Um, so I, I think it starts, I do believe that's something with myself, you know, with my, my students, and my colleagues. So if someone is inviting me to some really prestigious thing, I might actually recommend they invite the person who's really the best person for that, right? Not just, you know, I'm good, but this person is really good, you know? I, I think trying to be generous in that respect is, is really, really more important. We'll break till 11 for when our next panel will start.